Well, this morning, we're going to uh, keep traveling down that track that, uh, that we started on last Sunday. So there we go. There's a nice picture of a track. And I think, I think the, uh, the picture, actually, of a railroad track is quite appropriate because you can, uh, for what we're doing, uh, kind of continuing from last week on into the next coming weeks as... There's, there's something here that we're going to be unfolding as we work through uh, the Word, particularly through Ephesians, where we're going to see a track that we follow where, where the Scripture unfolds a continuing thought, and there's a, a progression of what the Lord is doing and what He's calling us to. So, so we're, just, uh, we're just at another place on that track moving forward. So last week we discussed... Uh, for those, for the benefit of those of you who weren't here, uh, last week we discussed a fairly, a fairly wide base of of schisms, of polarization and division that we all perceive to be permeating our world right now, and we went through a number of different examples of things that uh, that we and so many others are are perceiving in our world, uh, all sorts of different social divisions and political divisions and. Uh, and all manners of, of issues and things that are dividing our world quite bitterly. And uh, it's, it's more, as we discussed, it's more than just the issues or the philosophies of the day. But rather, the division is very much spiritual at its roots. And so to discern, to discern the issue of the dividing walls of hostility... That, that we have in, in our world right now. We took a look at, this, at the letter of Ephesians here. And the context of Ephesians is, is this one of addressing tensions within the early church as different groups of people, namely the Jews and the Gentiles, had previously been very divided and very hostile towards one another. But now, in Christ, they and we are called to unity and community the united covenant family of God that is the church. And we read in Ephesians chapter 2 that it is by, by grace alone that God, through Christ, He defeated the sin that brought us death and that was causing separation. And in raising us up in Him and seating us in Him in the heavenly places, we're also no longer on the, under the dominion of the deceiver who would also bring division. So by His grace, through Christ, He has brought us both near to Himself and He has brought us near to one another. Now Jesus in Himself has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. He's done the work. And He made in Himself both groups into one new creation, one new humanity. It is not just that Jesus accomplished our peace, but that Jesus himself is our peace. In him and through him, we can have peace with one another. In him and through him, we can walk with him and break down walls of dividing, dividing walls of hostility. So that's where we started. Now, continuing on today, uh, along our track... We're thinking again of the original context of the letter to the Ephesians, and, uh, and, and we continue to reflect on how we also continue to have cultural and racial tensions alive in our world today. This is still a big thing. I'm sure that all of us here are aware of the continuing and ongoing, uh, ongoing scenario between all Aboriginal peoples, all First Nations, Métis, Inuit peoples, and those of us who are European settlers or settlers from other lands. There's a lot of cultural racial tension and division within that. And currently, uh, as we uh, see a lot on the news right now, there's, there's a cultural and racial tension between Canadian citizens and a number of new immigrants that are coming into, uh, into our country, particularly immigrants that are coming here irregularly, which is the, the new term that's being used now. And there's a lot of tension 
and, uh, and divide over this right now. And of course, I think we would be uh, foolish and naive to not mention as well that there is still cultural and racial tension between those of us who are minority groups or pardon me, majority groups, and those of us who are minority citizens. It still exists. So the, the word within Ephesians here is still thoroughly relevant today. And I mean, even if we take a very broad survey of our world's history, we see that these kinds of tensions and hostilities and divisions have been festering within humanity since the dawn of recorded time. I mean, I, I'm a bit of a student of history, and I'm not aware of any era within our world's history where there hasn't been some sort of violence or subjugation or domination or division like this, where one group is pitted against another. The rulers and authorities of this world, as the scripture notates in many places, the rulers and authorities of this world have lacked the wisdom and the real power to secure a lasting peace. A peace that doesn't involve some form, of, some form of domination or subjugation or slavery or violence and that hasn't given some sort of advantage to one group over another. And that's even at the best of times. Even in the supposed civilized and enlightened nation like Canada, it still happens. And the authorities and rulers of this world do not have the wisdom and the power to overcome it. We know of terms like ethnic cleansing because the political solution for peace and prosperity, it almost always, or it does always, just usually in more subtle forms and sometimes more than others, it always is a road that leads down division, and leads down to death. Well, as the scriptures reveal, the ruler of the power of the air and the spiritual forces of evil, to use a few phrases from Ephesians here, which control and influence the rulers and authorities of flesh, they ultimately work in opposition to the will of God and to the rule of his kingdom. The kingdoms of this world are opposed to the kingdoms of our Lord. And we see this most clearly when we, uh, when we look at the final book of the Bible, where John very pointedly uh, gives some strong imagery to the rulers and authorities of this world. We find this image of the beast. And one thing that we learn about the beast is that the beast always acts in a beastly manner. A beast can't be anything other than a beast. And a beast always devours. There is no hope in the rulers and authorities of our world. The beast will always act in a beastly manner. And if we look further into the revelation that, that Jesus gave John in that last book of the Bible, we see as well that the beast, there's actually two beasts, the, the beasts are under the control of the dragon, who John explicitly identifies as Satan himself. The rulers and authorities of this world, even when there are good people working in the system, there's something bigger than them. There's something bigger than the sum total of them at work that is ultimately under the control of the devil. That's what the scripture tells us. So, what we're looking for as believers is we're looking for God's peace. We're looking for God's solution. We're looking for God's way forward because there is no hope without His way. So as we continue along the track of what is revealed in Scripture, we see with increasing clarity what is the will of God and the direction for the rule of His kingdom. So we're going to uh, look at Ephesians chapter 3 here now, but I want to just back up by two verses into Ephesians chapter 2 to kind of pick up a thought where he left off that's actually important for, uh, for where we're going now. 
So starting in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 21. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. So the context of, of uh, Ephesians 2, as you may remember, is, the, is that Jesus being our peace, taking the two divided ones, those who are far off, those who are near, making peace with them, making peace with each other, calling us into one new humanity. And here's kind of the, the denouement, the result here. That in him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Now, continuing on to chapter 3. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind as it is now, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become fellow heirs, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I am, very, I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So that through the church, the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose that he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence through faith in him. I pray, therefore, that you may not lose heart over my sufferings for you. They are your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. As we continue along this track with what's revealed here in Scripture, we see that the plan of God and the will of God is advancing. It's moving forward. The call of God in Christ to break down dividing walls and make peace, it advances forward to the call to join together as one, to function as a united body. The peace that God is seeking among his people is not just a cessation of hostilities or even some sort of beneficial cooperation. God is seeking that the two, having made peace, become one. That this new creation in Christ, this one new humanity, be built into a dwelling place for God. Joining together is about 
being built by God into a dwelling place for God. This is where he's going. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, are community and unity. Unity is part of who God is. God dwells where there is unity. Thus the psalmist says in Psalm 133, How good and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. We see this theme of joining together as uh, this theme of joining together as one and the presence of God's blessing throughout the entire letter of Ephesians. Where we come together, there is the presence of God, there is the blessing of God. For example, in chapter 1, where we just kind of blew over really fast last week, we get this glimpse of God's plan for the joining together of heaven and earth. And so we we went through this long list of blessings from chapter 1 that we reviewed, and that list of blessings are what it looks like when heaven and earth come together. It's what it looks like when heaven comes down to earth. All of those things in that in that amazing list. It's just like a a glimpse, a snapshot of the final victory that we see in Revelation 21, where heaven and earth come together forever, for all of eternity. Then in chapter 2 and 3 last week, we got a picture of God's plan for the joining together of different peoples, namely Jews and Gentiles. And then in chapter 4 and 5, if you skip ahead, we get a picture for God's plan for joining together different parts, different gifts and ministries of the church into one unified body of Christ. And then if you skip ahead even further into chapter 5 and 6, we get a picture of God's plan for joining together husband and wife into a new united family marked by the love of Christ. You see, this theme of joining together is important to the Lord. It's part of his plan. Joining together is part of the plan of God for the fullness of time to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. The way forward, through all of the stuff that we're experiencing, the way forward is to join together. The way forward is to stay together. Becoming a new creation in Christ is so much more and so much bigger than just ourselves. It's not just about me. It's about we. God is doing so much more as we become new creations in Him. Now, as we read here in chapter 3, the church, as the family of God, in which men, women, and children of every race, color, social, and cultural background join together in joyous worship of the one true God, we are all a sign to all of heaven and earth. Our existence, just our mere existence, our presence together, gathered together here like this. This is a physical sign. This is a manifestation of the rich and diverse wisdom of God. Only God can do this. Only God can do this. And it's precisely the fact that we the church are many cultured, many colored, many splendored that makes that point so clear. One of my favorite theologians, N.T. Wright, notes that God's wisdom is very much like this too. Like a many-faceted diamond which twinkles and sparkles with all the colors of the rainbow when you look at all the different sides and, and all the different facets. It's just beautiful as a whole and it's beautiful in all its uniqueness from every angle. The rulers and authorities... However, 
both earthly authorities and their shadowy heavenly counterparts, they always tend to create societies of their own that, uh, that are in their own flat and boring and monochrome and uniform and one-dimensional image. Which is why so often we see that they tend to marginalize or even kill people or groups who don't fit their narrow band of acceptability. I know I shared this uh, story uh, about a year and a half ago when our, when our mission team went to Nicaragua to, to visit some of the, uh, our vineyard churches down there. But we saw that with our eyes in a very bold and, uh, and in a way that you couldn't deny. Where many of the people who are of the Creole origin, who are... Uh, who are black-skinned, were being systematically oppressed and driven out by the government because they wanted a flat, monochrome, Spanish-speaking society. And the persecution took many, many different forms, but that's how they were going to achieve peace and prosperity in Nicaragua. We're not going to come together. We're going to divide apart. We're going to drive the black people out. We're going to drive the aboriginal people out. Become Spanish or else. This is what the rulers and authorities continue to do. But by the very fact of our existence, the existence of our church, the existence of La Vina Loma Fresca in Bluefields, Nicaragua, with people who are black, people who are Spanish, people who are mosquito, all worshiping together under the same roof on that land. By the fact of our very existence, the church is to be a warning to them, to these rulers and authorities, your time is up. Your time is up. It's an announcement to the world that there is a different way to be human. And the new way of being human has been unveiled in and through Jesus, together with the future hope that it contains. The consummation of God's kingdom is drawing nearer and nearer and nearer every single day. And this reconciliation of peoples that has started in the church and is carried through our history and continues on now, this reconciliation of people is evidence that God's final purpose in Christ to gather all things up in himself, it is about to reach its conclusion. God is doing it. And we can see it right here. God is doing it. We see evidence in our faces. His kingdom is coming near and near. All things will be gathered up in him and all things will be placed under his feet. Our existence as the gathered church, it also serves as a sign and declaration that Jesus is the world's true Lord and King. It's by His power that we are rooted, that we are rooted and grounded in His love, and it is by His power that we are able to walk in love and even be who we are, who He's made us to be. It's by His power that we, the church, advance the kingdom of God. Even in just the simple fact that we've gathered here together like this today. Isn't that awesome? Just the fact that this group of diverse people are gathered here today. We are advancing the kingdom of God. We are walking forward in love and unity against the powers of this age. We are the resistance. <laughs> Truly, if, uh, I mean, it, it <laughs> if you read this book and all that they went through in those first years, we are the resistance. We say no to Caesar. We say no to his plans for division, for hatred, for hostility, for segregation, for slavery, for violence. 
We say no to Caesar. We say no to joining the devouring of the beast. We follow a different, a different king. We follow the slain lamb. We don't take lives. We give our own life, just like he did. We say no to the devouring of the beast. We say no even to joining in the breath of the beast and all of the foul words of division. All of the foul words of hatred. All of the foul words of contempt against others. We're the resistance. We say no to this. That can be kind of hard when you're looking at your tax bill and then you see a little picture of Trudeau on Facebook. What a doofus. <clears throat> Send. No, that's not the way of the Lord. We're not going to join the beast in breathing out his lies and breathing out his division. Christ Jesus has given us another way. We are the resistance to his plan of hatred and violence and division. Our weapons are different. Our weapons are compassionate mercy. Our weapon is a spirit of brotherhood that breaks down walls rather than erects them. Our weapons are those of self-sacrificial love. Just in my own journey, I've often had to reflect what it must have been like for Jesus as he's hanging there on the cross. And people are ripping him with all sorts of names, cursing him, spitting at him. And yet, what did he do? Father, forgive them. That's self sacrificial, divine kind of love. And that's the same weapon that we wage our war with. We resist in joining together with the powers of darkness. And we choose to join together with Jesus and all of his people in love and in unity. And in do so, we seek justice for one another. We refuse to benefit at the cost of another. We give our lives for one another just as Christ gave his life for us. Now in talking about stuff like, the, like this, if there's any, any little bit of social justice worry, warrior in you, <laughs> there might be something in you that just wants to rise up and just rush and just act and ooh, storm the world and hey, we're going to make everything right and so forth. Uh, and it's good to take action and to put the word of God into action. But I think it's very instructive here what we see in Ephesians 3 for how the Apostle Paul actually goes forward with this. What does he do first? At the end of the chapter, he prays. Joining together, we can be tempted to rush out and to act and to just storm, storm the gates of the world. But Paul steps back and he frames all that he has to say in a prayer. Actually, all of chapter 3 is a prayer. The very first verse is a prayer and then there's kind of an interrupted section there to explain a few things and then he keeps going on and, and prays again. It really is a prayer what he's talking about here. He stops, pauses, and hits his knees. Now, particularly in the Western world here, the church has at times allowed itself to be fooled into thinking that, that prayer and that action, you know, that doing something, are at opposite ends of the spectrum of Christian living. That they're almost even opposed to one another. It's like, well, why don't you just stop praying and get out there and do something? It's foolish and unbiblical thinking. Because if we look here in the world, it's, if we look here in the Word, it's quite the opposite. 
Those who want their actions to be effective for God's kingdom need to learn from the apostle and the vital role of prayer here. Prayer brings together love and power. Now there's a, there's a lot in that here um, that I just can't unfold today. But there's a theme of love and power going through, uh, through our chapter here. And prayer is the thing that brings it together. That brings together the experience of the love of God and operating in the love of God. And the experience of the power of God and operating in the power of God. And prayer and a life of prayer is what ties them together. It is in prayer that the relationship of love grows up between God and those of us who pray. And at the same time, it is in the prayer that the power of God flows to and especially through that person. This is where it starts. This is where it starts. Look around. Open your eyes and look around. Not just your physical eyes, but your eyes of faith. Look around. Look around and you see the reality of the Word of God with your own eyes. Notice the diversity of people that are gathered here around the Lord's table in this room right now. Think of all the different languages, the language groups that we have here. I can look around and think of several. Think of the different nationalities and lands of origin that we come from. Maybe we're immigrants or second generation or whatnot, but think of all of that. Our gathering together for the Eucharist, which we do on a regular basis, this isn't just a trite ceremony that we do at church. This is peacemaking in Christ Jesus. This is peacemaking in Jesus. In the bread and the wine, or in actually gluten-free rice crackers and unsweetened juice. (laughs) We're going to taste with our mouths, and we're going to see with our eyes that the Lord is good. Every time we gather and we do this, we physically experience that He is good in what He has done. This is the gathering of the church against which the gates of hell will not prevail. This is why this has always been the central act of Christian worship. Because here we really get to see it. We really get to see it. And it is as we gather and join together as invitees to the Lord's table... It's here where the maintaining of the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace becomes real. This is the thing that dreams are made of. This is the human dream for peace that the world cannot achieve. This is the human dream for peace. But let's not be fooled. This dream is not our own. As we read, this dream originated in the heart of God before the foundation of the world. It's part of his eternal purposes, his plan for the fullness of time. It is his dream. We're black people, white people, Asian people, Aboriginal people, Slavic people, Arab people, people from all over Europe where we have here. We can be joined together at the table of brotherhood where the burden of injustice and oppression will be transformed into freedom and justice among us where people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of who lives in their heart. Now, joining hands as brothers and sisters, we see valleys brought high, hills and mountains brought low, rough places made plain and crooked places made straight. And in this, the glory of the Lord is revealed and all flesh can see it. And it is a sign to the powers and the authorities in the heavenly places. We're it right now. Jesus is our peace. And now we get a deeper vision of how he is our peace and becomes our peace. You see it? 
You see it when you look around? This is how he's done it, and this is how he continues to do it. So look around and see the glory of God revealed in all of these diverse faces. Only God can love this way, and only God has the power to enable us to love this way. And as, for the, as the apostle said, for this reason we bow our knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. And we pray that according to the riches of his glory, he might grant that we might be strengthened in our inner being with power through his spirit, that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith as we are being rooted and grounded in love. And we pray that we might have the power to comprehend with all of the saints here and around the world what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge. Why? So that we, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God.